thank you very much for inviting me. So yeah, I decided that since I talked about Meerkat on my ongoing work in the previous seminar series, I'm going to talk about baboons and uh, mostly my previous work today, so that like if people fancy coming to both talks, they have a bit of a variety of topics. Uh, and I'm going to talk about sexual selection in females today. That's one of my favorite topics, actually. Uh, and um, like base uh, my talk on these striking sexual swellings that are produced by uh, female primates to um, talk a bit about um, yeah, the operation of sexual selection in females. So first of all, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about what sexual selection is, in case uh, you're not all familiar with that. So sexual selection, that's the theory uh, with which um, that Darwin proposed when he was confronted with this difficulty that it was basically uh, proposing his theory of natural selection and struggle for survival. And then in some animals, uh, you found these kind of traits, which obviously do not seem to contribute to survival. Because if you're this peacock and you're carrying this tail, it's quite likely that you will be more vulnerable to predation than uh, if you don't carry this tail. So it was a bit of a problem for him to account for the evolution of this kind of traits. Um, and that's how he came up with sexual selection. He also noticed that uh, these kind of traits are usually carried only by one sex and not, not by both. So there is sexual dimorphism in that. Uh, and that's, that's uh, why he called them like secondary sexual characters, uh, because these traits are basically uh, not directly related to survival. They are also not directly related to reproduction. They are not like um, genital organs, for example, but they differ among sexes, so secondary sexual characters. And here's what he proposed. He found that there are two kinds of secondary sexual characters. Um, these, uh, these traits that look like armaments or weapons, uh, and these traits like, um, that are extravagant and colorful and that look like ornaments, uh, that might reflect the operation of two different processes. Uh, in this case, uh, he proposed that um, armaments help uh, the individuals that carry them to fight against potential rivals of the same sex to access uh, part, uh, mates, potential mates of the other sex. And in this case, he proposed that ornaments uh, have evolved to help uh, individuals carrying them to attract and seduce uh, partners of the opposite sex. Uh, he also noticed that usually these kind of uh, secondary sexual characters, whether it's armaments or ornaments, are more often found in males than in females. And since that, um, Research and going research in sexual selection has proposed a framework to explain why these ornaments are and armaments are more often found in males than in females. Basically, the uh, idea is that the costs of reproduction are usually higher for females than for males. So, for example, in mammals, females uh, have long gestation and lactation periods, and during these periods, they won't be sexually receptive, so they won't be part of the pool of potential partners for the males. And so, quite often, at any given time, there will be more males ready to mate than females, which means that females become the limiting resource for males, and which explains why this um, well, competition, reproductive competition is more important in males than in females, and why these armaments and ornaments are mostly found in males. Um, and like the study of sexual selection has uh, been sleeping a bit after Darwin. It's, it's been ignored for quite a long time. Uh, but then there has been renewed interest, like starting in the 60s, 70s, and it's now a very, very important topic in evolutionary, in modern, contemporary evolutionary biology. And people have proposed a theory explaining why male, well, why actually females uh, prefer to mate with those males that carry these uh, incredible colors or these extravagant ornaments. So this theory proposes that these ornaments are actually costly to carry. I uh, talked about the potential predation costs for the peacock tail. Like if you're very colorful, you will be uh, detected more easily by predators. And so you'd better run fast. Um, and so only these individuals that are in very, very good condition uh, will be able to carry these uh, ornaments. Uh, which means that from a female perspective, if you choose one of these males with like very, very bright colors, that means that you might be able to transmit uh, very good genes to your offspring and good viability genes to your offspring. So this theory is uh, known as the good genes theory um, uh, yeah, for the evolution of ornaments in evolutionary biology. And then the other thing is, um, 
Obviously, because uh, as you can see, like the males are uh, all beautiful and uh, carry interesting ornaments, but like the females all look uh, grey and boring and not very interesting. Like people studying sexual selection have tended to focus a lot on males and not very much on females. Uh, but recently, uh, it's realized that okay, well, sexual selection obviously is a dynamic process. It's an, inter in, an interaction between males and females, and if you only look at one side of the coin, perhaps you're missing some important processes that are happening on the other side. But perhaps it's also important to uh, understand better the role that females play in sexual selection. So uh, that's what I've been trying to do. And um, there's like recent evidence suggesting um, that actually sexual selection in females might be quite important to look at. Um, so for example, in some societies, like in mercat societies, the uh, females compete more strongly over reproduction than males. And so for those of you who attended my, my seminar in the previous terms, I, I showed pictures of how females like fiercely fight uh, for the access to dominance when the dominant female uh, die and when they want to inherit dominance. Um, I've also uh, spoken a bit about the fact that um, uh, for the, the average reproductive success can be actually higher for, well, actually, variance in reproductive success can be higher in females than in males in meerkats. So basically, the operation of sexual selection in meerkats uh, seems to be more important for females than for males. Then in some other animals, like in uh, African antelope, uh, it's been observed that females can aggressively compete with each other to access to a mating partner. And finally, I'm coming to this uh, very, very intriguing uh, um, sexual swellings that are produced by uh, many primates uh, in multi-male, multi-female groups. And that very, very much look like ornaments because it doesn't look obvious that they might have any function for survival. Um, their position suggests that they might have to do with uh, attracting a sexual partner. And in all, three of, uh, all these three cases, um, it's occurring in mammals where females actually face higher costs for reproduction than males. They've got the cost of gestation and then the cost of lactation. So it's not very easy to understand with the uh, framework that I showed you earlier why uh, sexual selection might be so important in those species. So I'm going to... Uh, Talk a bit more about this example, which was my PhD. My PhD subject initially is like, okay, so uh, here's the private sexual swellings, like, well, here's the sexual swellings of baboons. Please um, come up with some ideas about like why they occur and why they've evolved. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a few facts about primate sexual swellings um, to give you basically the background that I had when I started to work on this question. So private sexual swings are found in uh, multi-male, multi-female groups of old world monkeys. Um, so for example, that's in mandrails, in Japanese macaques, but also in, in chimpanzees, so in, in some of our closest relatives. The swelling size uh, reflects female fertility uh, within a anastrous cycle, which means that if a female is not sexually receptive, then she doesn't have any swelling. But then um, swelling size will slowly, gradually increase uh, towards her cycle until being maximal uh, when the probability of ovulation is maximal. There is a male preference for large swellings, which makes sense given what I just said. It's like if uh, males choose females with uh, bigger swellings, then they will uh, pick up females that are more fertile and closer to ovulation. And then um, the uh, maximal size, well, the size and the shape of sexual swellings, when they're at their maximal size, when they're just around ovulation, uh, can vary quite extensively uh, between females. So these are all sexual strengths for my population. I'm, I'm sorry that you're eating at the moment. <laughs> it's like, usually, when I give this talk, it's like outside. <laughs> and, time. and so I had two main questions. Um, the first question was, uh, so do sexual swellings uh, signal good condition in a symmetrical way as uh, ornaments of males do? And the second question was, Actually, I mean, if uh, they've evolved uh, in a symmetrical way as male ornaments have, then I would expect females to compete over mates, because if there is absolutely no mating competition among, among females, then they should not be selected to uh, attract males. So, let's talk a bit about that. So I uh, was lucky enough to work on uh, Shekhmer uh, They're quite lovely animals to work with. 
Um, well, it's perhaps not obvious when seeing that, uh, but they're very, very interesting anyway, and really, really nice. Um, so, Chuck Mabuse is live in Southern Africa. Um, they live in large multi-male, multi-female groups. Um, they, as you can see, sexual dimorphism is quite extensive, like an adult male is about twice as uh, heavy as uh, an adult female. Um, you can immediately see that uh, there is very, very intense um, reproductive competition among males. Uh, when um, the male is, uh, well, managed to win a fight and to win all the fights against his rivals, he managed to acquire the alpha rank, and then he gets priority of access to uh, the receptive females in his group, so he gets like obvious benefits in terms of reproduction. Um, like the actually size of the canines of baboons is one of the uh, biggest among uh, African mammals. It's like bigger than leopards, or interestingly. Um, and then they've got like yeah, lovely little baboons. <laughs> so uh, I worked in central Namibia, like basically here. So here you've got the Namib Desert, so that's right on the edge of the Namib Desert. And uh, the field site where I was working looks a bit like that. So that's uh, arid and mountainous and beautiful. It's a very challenging environment for the baboons to live in because uh, there are very, very long droughts that they need to survive through with like very, very little food. Um, but yeah, quite beautiful landscape. Uh, so studying baboon in the field, giving some kind of insights about the methods. Uh, baboons are fully habituated to the presence of observers, so you can uh, move in the middle of the group and collect data, like observe uh, one individual or another and record everything that he does. Um, time to time, whatever we got enough funding for, we trap all our baboons, and that allows us to collect biological samples, so for example, little tissue bi biopsies for genetic analysis. Um, but also, uh, morphometric measures, like that, you can see, we weight our baboons, and um, that will allow me to derive a condition index uh, for my baboons, an index of nutritional condition. So taking the uh, weight of the baboon and um, controlling it by the size of the baboon to see whether one, one individual is in good shape or not. Uh, then we can actually um, look at their teeth to estimate age. So you can see that's an old male, he lost like nearly all his canines apart from one. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a very, very insightful, insightful source of information about our baboons when we can trap them. So then to, uh, to test my hypothesis, to see whether big swellings reflect uh, female body condition, nutritional condition, I also needed to measure those swellings. So to do that, I just like, basically ran after the baboons uh, the whole day with a camera uh, to try to get a picture of a good angle. And with uh, an unfortunate uh, field assistant next to me, who was in charge of measuring the distance between the baboon and me, uh, it's because, <laughs> I mean, say it like that, it, it might sound straightforward, but actually it's not. Uh, as you can see, it's very mountainous, baboons move quickly, um, it's very, very hot. Uh, and usually if you want to get enough good pictures to do that, you need to do that the whole day. So it's actually incredibly tough. Um, but it's good fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so then, with the data, I could uh, see whether like, the nutritional condition of the females uh, would uh, correlate with the size of the swelling. And I did find a nice uh, positive correlation. Uh, you can see that like, those dots that are related, uh, connected by these little dots are two consecutive swellings of the same female. Um, so it means that in this, uh, in this graph I've got 13 females in total and 20 cycles. So some of the females have been observed for several cycles. So it's not very much, uh, but it took me uh, one year and a half, uh, 18 months in the field uh, to get this data. So uh, it's pretty uh, precious anyway. I was quite happy with that, <laughs> even if it just looks like a little small <coughs> correlation. And so these are data that suggest that, uh, yes, actually sexual swellings do uh, signal uh, good condition in female baboons because those, uh, those females that are in good condition have bigger swellings than those females that are in bad condition. Then my second question was um, to try to understand whether females actually compete for access to mates. In fact, uh, before I started my PhD, that uh, everybody uh, tended to think that uh, there is no mating competition in baboon groups uh, from a female perspective because uh, baboons are a seasonal breeder 
So that means that females can actually be sexually receptive any time during the year. So there's no one mating season where all the females are receptive at the same time. Uh, that means that very often there's only one female who is sexually receptive in a group, and there are uh, several different, well, several, several adult males. So that means that mating competition, presumably, is not important for this female. And this problem has been a major obstacle to understand why these sexual swellings evolve, because it seems that mating competition is not important. So I've tried to um, um, actually look at this question anyway, and uh, to envisage the different uh, sources of competition that females could uh, face. Basically, what can comp uh, females compete for in this big group? Well, first, they can compete for food. I think that's fairly obvious. Second, they can compete for offspring care. Um, because it's been observed that in, in Chakma Bunz, when a female has just given birth, usually she associates very closely with an adult male. She will start like following this adult male everywhere with her tiny infant. Um, and it seems that this male uh, will provide protection against infanticide for this infant. That means that if another adult male comes and tries to attack the infant, he's going to fight against this male and try to protect the infant. Um, infanticide uh, is very important uh, pressure in Chakna baboons that can account for up to 30% of mortalities uh, of babies uh, in some populations. So it's quite an important threat for the babies. So it might be quite a precious resource for the females to fight for. And finally, uh, whether they might compete for mates, which uh, the beginning of the story was uh, the most unlikely hypothesis. So what I tried to do is to see how aggression between females would fluctuate in relation to uh, the different stages of the reproductive cycle of the female. So basically, the idea is that if females do compete over sex, I expect that those females that are sexually receptive exchange most aggression compared to uh, females in another state. But if females mainly compete over food, I expect that uh, aggression is mainly exchanged among uh, gestating and lactating females because that's those females who are at the greatest need for uh, energetic supply. And then finally, if females compete over infant care, I expect that lactating females with a small infant exchange most aggression for the access to a male partner. So then I try to see how aggression between females fluctuates across these different reproductive states. So here's the, that's basically what I just said. My different, the different predictions that I was trying to test in this uh, framework. So the first thing that I, okay, so then just a few insights of the methods, methods to test these questions. Um, so it mainly consisted in taking focal observations, following uh, females everywhere to record uh, everything that they did, and especially uh, patterns of aggression that they exchanged with other females. So uh, it involved like two groups, 27 females, uh, 1,800 hours of observations, and uh, I uh, also focused quite a lot on uh, male-female friendships, like after a baby is just born, uh, and male gathering episodes, so that's when a female is uh, maximally swollen, uh, usually there will be a high-ranking male who will follow a female everywhere and try to uh, prevent uh, potential rivals to mate with this female. And so what I started to look at is when the number of female in a given reproductive state increases in a group, whether that with the, aggress the, the amount of aggression exchanged among females will va vary. So you can see that when there are more pregnant females in the group, the amount of aggression exchanged among females does not really increase. Then when there are more, uh, up to like 50% of uh, females being lactating in a group, um, Similarly, you can see that the amount of aggression does not uh, increase a lot. But when the number of sexually uh, receptive females increase in a group, and when there are many sexually receptive females at the same time in a the group, then the amount of aggression exchange between females really seems to uh, increase a lot. <coughs> then I checked, uh, I looked at the amount of aggression received by one particular female on average during one hour of observation in relation to a reproduction, reproductive states. You could see that those females who are sexually receptive receive uh, almost twice as much aggression as those females who are lactating, and even more compared to those females who are pregnant. So if I come back to my hypothesis, it seems that actually aggression is most important uh, among swollen females, and that females might actually be competing over mates. Then I tested another two predictions. Uh, still to answer this question. I um, predicted that 
if females um, compete over paternal care, I expect like that the females who have managed to secure a male front will actually have uh, face more aggression than those females who have not managed to secure a male front to protect their infants. And then similarly, uh, if females are competing over mates, I expected that those females who are mate guarded by a high-ranking mate who have managed to secure a mate will face more aggression from other females than those females who have not managed to secure a mate. And here's what's happening. So I can see that uh, the amount of aggression received by females who have or who don't have a male friend when they're lactating doesn't change at all. But then I can see that the amount of aggression received by those females who are male guarded by a higher ranking male is much higher than the level of aggression received by those females who are actually sexually receptive but who are not guarded by a higher ranking male. So again, that suggests that females compete over mates and that uh, male guarded females face higher aggression than others. So do females compete for access to mates? It looks like they do actually, because they're much more aggressive when they are sexually receptive. Uh, but there is something I haven't showed you in these results, which nuance a bit this interpretation. Is that I've only talked to, so far about uh, the level of aggression that females do receive. I haven't talked so far about the level of aggression that they emit towards other females. If I look at that, I can see that the most aggressive females are not swollen females, what I would expect under my mating competition hypothesis, but it's pregnant females. So it's a bit confusing, it's a bit annoying because it's, uh, <laughs> it makes it a bit more difficult to interpret uh, those results. Actually, it's not so clear that it's a pure mating competition. Um, so what's happening? I don't have a definite answer for you today, I'm sorry, but uh, here's what I think is happening. I think actually they are not competing for food and they are not competing for mates. I think what they're competing for is paternal care. But I think the key of the story is that if you want to secure paternal care, it's too late to start when you're having an infant. What you have to do is uh, secure uh, mating through a male because males uh, won't invest in an infant, won't protect an infant if he um, hasn't mated with the mother and he, if he doesn't think that this infant might be his infant. So if you want to access paternal care, most likely you have to access to uh, a male uh, when you're sexually receptive and to have like this episode of male guarding, this uh, tight relationship with the male at this period so that the male thinks that uh, the baby who is born is his uh, baby and uh, might be motivated to protect him. Um, so I don't have a demonstration of that, it's my interpretation of it. Uh, but what I know, well, I've already uh, talked a bit about that, that uh, males uh, do protect uh, the offspring of their female friends, again, infanticide in early life. So you, can, you can very often see males carrying this kind of behavior, like carrying a baby or grooming a baby or spending time with a baby. Uh, <coughs> and here's what happens if they don't manage to, uh, if babies don't manage to gain some protection by males. <laughs> it's quite a dramatic picture. Well, it's good like you're finished with your lunch. <laughs> uh, and so here's what, um, what I found out later, just pursuing a bit this research on paternal care. Uh, recently I, I found out these male friends uh, with whom females associate are usually the fathers of the offspring. So we did find out that by carrying paternity analysis uh, on the babies and looking at whether that matches with the identity of the male protecting them. Uh, and more recently that um, apparently these uh, bonds between father and offspring uh, don't occur only in early life but last much longer than that and when the baby is very young that might be uh, protection against infanticide but it seems that when the baby grow up um, fathers help them accessing good quality food uh, which is very precious uh, resource in that kind of environment especially. <coughs> so Actually, I, I got quite a lot of media attention about this uh, later story this week uh, on BBC Nature and Plant Earth, so if you want to find out more, then you're welcome to uh, have a look. Um, and so, just to finish up, I uh, hope I managed to convince you that it's interesting to look at sexual selection in females, that uh, ornaments and reproductive competition are not confined to males, but also occur among females. Um, but that when females compete, it's probably uh, more of a breeding opportunities and the resources that males can provide uh, than over sperm and gametes. 
uh, and that uh, well, mechanisms of sexual selection uh, are qualitatively similar in both sexes, and it's very, very likely that males also choose their uh, partner, uh, and that females actually compete for access to high-quality partners. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.